Okay, I'm Matt Davio back at the One Minute Trader podcast. And today I've got Sarah Herring, who is, uh, hang on one second. Oh, shoot. Who is a uh, producer and presenter for iBiz, I'm going to call, I don't know if that's how you say it, but iBiz Media, uh, head of video and podcasting, also for Poker News. So hopefully many of you have listened to Sarah's uh, podcast on Poker News. I've listened to a few, I was listening to one. Last week, uh, per my assistant, Tony was recommending listening to Sarah and having having her on. So here we are one week later after listening to her. I'm like, yeah, I definitely want to have her on. And we were talking um, before, you, before we came on the air, Sarah, give us a little bit of background of how you got into podcasting, how you got into, you know, it's, it's an entertainment uh, business. So you'd mentioned your husband was, was a, you know, UFC fighter. Yeah. So um... was. Yeah, he's retired now, okay. but uh, well, sort of. I mean, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Right. But, uh, yeah, so I come from a film and television background, but I was always behind the camera. So more or less, I was a, an AD, which is kind of like a film set manager. You do scheduling and this. And I worked on a little known movie, which was originally entitled Sex, Blood, and Fights, which okay. Later was became Never Surrender, but basically it was starring a bunch of professional fighters. Um, and at the time, my husband was one of the uh, biggest fighters sort of in the business, and he was on the movie. So we met on this movie okay. and, of course, you know, fell madly in love. <laughs> and How did you choose between the fighters? Oh, yeah. I know. Honestly, it was hysterical <laughs> because I thought, oh, these, I'm so, especially at the time, I, you know, I was 24. Four or something and I thought oh these guys are all a bunch of idiots and they're just a bunch of dumb jocks and um but you know my husband speaks multiple languages and he lived in lots of countries and I was like oh hey there buddy like this guy this not guy only is he good looking but yeah. he's pretty smart <laughs> exactly so um between the two of us we were going back and forth he lived in Vegas I lived in LA and eventually when it got more serious, um, I decided to move in with him. And so this left me in a weird spot where there's, I was traveling still to do films, but you know, being away from each other for months at a time is taxing on, on a relationship. And we, you know, ultimately kind of decided that I just, I didn't want, not that I don't, I still now travel quite a lot, but uh -huh. for shorter periods of time. Um, so I was just looking for some production type work in Las Vegas and they had a, the world series of poker is mm -hmm. going to be here. And so I applied for like a production assistant job, okay. which broke my heart because I'd already done all this work in my life to get to a place where, you know, I was on the fast track. I was on the track to maybe be the youngest uh, female in the director's guild. Wow. And, but you know, everything, you know, everything yeah. changes and you're not the boss. And I said, all right, swallow my pride. Let's just do this. And long story short, I started in that sort of position. And then very quickly I was more or less doing what I was doing in film, but for um, this company called Poker News, who basically the bread and butter for Poker News is that um, small teams of people go and cover poker tournaments. Okay. So it's like journalism basically. And so I was helping with traveling and scheduling and this. And then one day um, I was producing some video content for a big poker site called Poker Stars. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how familiar you're your homies are with poker, but yeah, poker stars. I'm sure a lot are. And I've got, <laughs> and, and I'll tie in my own poker analogies for you because I, I don't like the game. There's so many analogies, though. I think yeah. to trading, it's crazy. Some of the only ways that I can relate to understanding, yeah. Yeah. you know, things that traders talk about is through poker. Um, but basically, someone put me in front of the camera. One of the guys from Poker Stars said, "Hey, I'd love to see you um, in front of the camera." And so. Pretty quickly, I was doing, you know, sort of a hybrid position. So I was traveling and playing the role of a presenter, creating video content, writing my own scripts, and then actually performing them. Right. And then, but still maintaining this same role on the back end, kind of, you know, scheduling and this. And the role has just grown bigger and bigger within iBus and within Poker News. So now... But for two years, I've been running the podcasting department. So we have several podcasts. I'm the host of the Poker News podcast. Um, but we, and actually I'm really trying, I think by January, we're going to have four new poker specific podcasts, wow. which I will only host one of. And, but we have also had poker, uh, we've also had podcasts on fantasy sports. We had one called Fantasy Wired. Um, I would think that's growing. I would think that's a, a growing entity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and I was helping to provide video content as well. 
So we have Casino Smash is part of the iBus Media Network. Um, Bookie Smash, uh, which is you know sports betting, yeah. and we have the. Well, I mean, with with you know, I just did an interview this week with a with a Vegas based hedge fund manager. It's a sports hedge fund manager, right? Because in, in fifteen those became legal. And it's pretty interesting. So I was talking to him, even though it's been legal since 15 in Vegas and he can now take money, it's still, you know, it's slow moving. It's people don't really know this about the business. So it's very, but that's the exciting thing probably in your business because everything is so moving, so, you know, changing so fast and adapting and growing and these new markets from UFC to poker, right? I mean, it's crazy. Um, and we're, like, so how many years have you been doing the, 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 the uh, Poker News podcast? So the Poker News podcast I've only been doing for two years. But I mean, that's a, long, that's a long well, time. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's true, relatively speaking. But the podcast itself has been going for, um, I want to say it started maybe seven or eight years ago. And so the host before um, left our company and then I sort of took over his role okay. a couple years ago. And of course, all of us have a different flavor. And he was much more the, you know, poker. He was very into poker. Gotcha. And I am very into poker, but I have lots of other interests as yes. well. And so, yeah, so, we all so you said you play, you don't play professionally, you play for fun, and you're probably pretty good at it, I would imagine. Because again, I have this philosophy. And, and part of the reason why I've kind of tasked my assistant or you know my my produce my production assistant is listen go out and find women who want to talk about uh risk they want to talk about yes. games of chance they want to talk about management of risk because as you and i both know typically the female in the family runs the finances in the house i mean they're the ones that just you know hey should we get this new car uh well you know it's kind of out of our budget but maybe we could afford it if it was lit right so why aren't they taking that into, you know, kind of the alternative investing areas beyond just saving our money and putting it into, an, you know, a passive fund, uh, ETFs, which is totally a part of what everybody should do. But I believe that they, if you have interest and have desire and are good with simple math, trading is for everybody. There's a spot for it in your portfolio. Now, I'm not saying it, 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 it should be for everybody and all inclusive, right? But there, there is a spot. There's a sweet spot in your portfolio for ten percent of the time, or you know, you get the money. However, you want to work it out, where it makes a lot of sense. So, with your interest in poker, like, where are you in that? You know, have you have you got into some money games? Do you do some of those things? I mean, it's super interesting because even when we were talking about, um, you know, the the bet sports betting and mm -hmm. these types of things, for there was this big explosion about two to three years ago of fantasy sports, which right. was when uh, like DF, uh, DFS and uh, fantasy. Yep. There was basically like these three big companies Dude, that yeah. were just throwing money. DraftKings uh, and all those guys. DraftKings, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they were. Uh, I was tasked with creating some video content for them, and I could see so many parallels. Of course, it was attracting a lot of poker players because it's you know all these guys who are just working out you know the sort of algorithms and working action out action junkies. I think they have an edge, right? Fully, fully, and and then also how there's all these you know weird ways where um, you know oh you get you know, your, your de first deposit bonus here and you get, oh, there's an overlay on mm -hmm. this. And I definitely saw a lot of parallels. And so I, I was dipping my toes a little bit in the fantasy, but the reality is I'm not interested yeah. in sports. I don't care. About well, sports. you know, what's funny is I, I am a sports fan, but I have no interest in fantasy as a, as a thing. And, and, and I guess, you know, also I'll, I'll say this, that I've played Texas Hold'em. I know how to play it. Um, here's what's interesting for me. And I've, you haven't heard this story. I tell this story often because it's a way I describe how I do what I do. I don't like playing poker myself. It's too slow paced. It's too boring. There's too much luck in the, in the, in the bluffing side of things. And I'm not good at bluffing. <laughs> it's, hundred. I actually completely agree with you on so many levels, which is that I pretty much only play for fun. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the reason is that, you know, I think if you're going to do something, you might as well do it well. So, yeah. you know, look at it and put your time into it. And it's just not something I'm interested in putting all my time in. But 
the uh, boring part of it makes it so I pretty much only want to play poker when I'm drinking and enjoying. So you could say, well, at table so, time. so, but I get that. I get the social side of it, but I would be in there just folding, folding, giving, you know, giving, <laughs> giving the, giving the uh, river away, you know, giving just my chips just to play, get my yeah. free drinks. And that's all I'd be there for too. That's that, that's how I play because, and then when I go all in, you know, he's got a full house, forget it, you know, and then I lose anyways, cause you have four, you know, you got four of something. So just the way it works. But what you're doing is something that I'm more interested in. Um, my husband recently started uh, options trading for his career, basically, and he's spending tons of time in it. But something that, so he watches his trade a lot, and I hear, I can hear that it's not something you have to do all of the time. And I also can see so many parallels to all of these other. So, for example, they recently uh, launched something. They Mike McDonald recently launched a site. It's called Poker Shares. Okay. Shares. I hope I'm not messing that up. But um, basically the idea was we used to call him the bank of Timex because he would basically lay odds on almost anything. So any tournament, he would give you odds, any random bet someone had, or it was interesting. So we called him the bank of Timex because if you wanted to make a bet, you could basically make one with him. Well, he, he was, he was, a, he was a walking bookie is what he was. Exactly. Cause he, he knows, he knows money. that people want, again, want action and he'll make money. Yeah. Yeah. So now you make this site where you can basically bet on everything and they huh. give you odds on everything. So you could invest, say for example, it used to be with a poker player. If you wanted to invest in his poker tournament, you could give him, say the you know buy-in of the tournament is $10,000. You could give him a thousand and he would say, okay, it'll be a little bit of markup, but I'll give you you know this percentage of my tournament. So maybe you have to give him 1200 to get a thousand dollars worth of okay. his or whatever it is it, yeah. so basically you had to have a direct contact with this player but what mike's done is he's made it so that they're laying odds on players so you can invest in a player to win just without it's kind of the it's kind of like a consortium that's backing these guys so they can enter the tournaments they don't have to always find the sugar daddy or mama to you know put up their money if they're new to the game and they're good well, you know what whatever most the thing of the sites do but yeah. this is actually like he's just laying odds so you can bet that a player will win and that player never sees any of the money my, you know, this mm -hmm. poker shares just lays odds on players and you can take bets <laughs> or they lay odds on all kinds of things. They lay odds on fights on can someone like ride their bike this far or I don't know. It's pretty crazy, but it, it definitely did get me thinking about, um, you know, risk and yeah. how to that there are all these calculated risks and a lot of these players that are figuring out ways to make money on finding the right, you know, exact price point of that risk is right they're making tons. And so my own personal experience with investing has been very small so far. I started investing in uh, gold and silver about five or six years ago, which um, I'm kind of like a con crazy conspiracy nut person. So okay. that just seemed like an easy Fair enough. Option. I was gonna ask, you know, where, where you yeah. stand on that site. Uh, <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you own physical? Do you own physical? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I have tangible um, silver and gold. Okay. And then I recently, yeah. last year, um, invested a little bit in some crypto, just in Bitcoin. Uh -huh. but last Obviously, year well last yeah. year was a good time to do it even that whatever you probably exactly. let's see did you spend 200 or 300 400 where were you yeah so i started with 500 and then good for you tenfold earlier Damn. this year i added um some more i think I, I put in 1k around january and but this it is something where all of a sudden i've been realizing holy crap i've made as much on you know this bitcoin investment as i've made like working my job okay so can <laughs> I don't want to get, I trade, I trade crypto. Uh, I've never, um, as a trader, I'm just not, that, that would never be something that I could do because if I bought I it, at, no, what, but if I bought it at $500, like you did, I would have sold it at, let's just say 800 and I'd be like, yeah, 60%. Right. Uh -huh. Profit. You took it. And so, but I do that over and over again. And, and matter of fact, I was just telling a friend of mine, he's like, oh, you know, I, I, so same thing. He was like, I had a customer pay me and he's in the sports business and he, you know, he does advisory stuff. And he said, I had a customer pay me in crypto and it was, you know, it was 1100, 1200. And I, and he, and you know, he starts telling me that at 1800 and I said, well, I'd sell it. Yeah. Right. And he's like, oh, I'm going to hold on to it. And so every time 3000, 4,000, five, six last weekend, he just and now keeps it's back down to 56. So well, gotta... yeah. It, matter of fact, I was selling it at 58, 59, and I bought it back at 53. I'm looking for a move to 45. 
And then, you know, anyways. See, and that's what my husband was saying. I said, here's the thing about the trading that, so basically what I'm looking for is to say, okay, of course, maybe I want to have like an IRA and mm -hmm. these kind of basic things, but I'm, it's getting to the age where I clearly need to be doing some. Right. But so, so then, I, so, so, so then, then I see you having a tenfold poll, right? Why not take half off? Yeah, no, I, I, it's definitely something. And actually, I mean, cause that's a, I, I, I mean, if like people always say, if I owned Apple at, you know, from 1980 to now, it's gone up to, you know, that, that same number, whatever, a thousand percent. And you're right. sitting on those types of gains. Please take some for me, just take half. And then the rest is free, you know? If it goes to zero, you've made money. Please. And that's what my mom did, actually. I'm really proud of my mom. She bought like $200 ages Please, ago, yeah. and then she left the $200 Perfect. but took the profit. She's like, I'll just let it ride, but I'm gonna take this like $1,500. I mean, because that is, that is, it is an absolute gift. I, I guess right. that's what I'm saying. Those are once in a lifetime things, and I, I'm not that smart, so. Um, <laughs> but I would suggest. <laughs> but so there's lesson one, as a risk manager, if Don't you're blind. If, and if you're blindly lucky, admit it and take the money, right? right. It's not like uh, you worked in the industry and you saw it coming. It's nothing like that. So, <laughs> I mean. Here's a little gift. I mean, even if, <laughs> well, even if I were in it, like I would, like uh, I told you, I would have sold it 10 times already. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so poker, here's my analogy with poker. I love what, here, so I do watch poker. Yeah. I don't play poker. Guess why I watch it? Because they're brilliant people and it's interesting. Well, I like the way it's edited, right? Because that makes that- it's entertaining. It creates these situations. The drama <laughs> is there. That's number one. It's very well done. And But but within that, right, it may take hours for that one half an hour to play game. out, right? It yeah. really might. And that's why I can't play it because I can, I got, I have four kids and I have other things to do. But, oh my. yeah, so, but why I like watching World Series of Poker, all the, you know, what, 17, how, whatever number they're on, yeah. I will, I will watch it. If I'm, if I'm up watching the market late at night, watching the European Open, which is midnight, we're both on Pacific, mm -hmm. that's midnight our time. If I'm, by chance, I'm still up and I, I'm flipping through, I'm kind of bored, I can't fall asleep, I will watch, you know, you know World Series of Poker. And I find fascinating, this, like you said, the brilliance and the, and, and the, the stories about these guys from Helmuth to uh, what's his sister's name and, you know, uh, the, what's her name? Annie Duke? Yeah, Annie Duke. Annie. I mean, they're so smart, right? And I love listening to them do interviews and, and talk because I learn, again, about that risk management. But the, the reason why I watch it is because I am good with numbers, simple numbers. Yeah. And I can play the game when I can see all the cards. Right. <laughs> like, now I'll play. Your percentage. Here. Yeah. Now I'll play. But obviously the guys at the table don't see what you and I see on TV. Also why it's fantastic because it's brilliant marketing without even people knowing they're being marketed to. But see, it's the same thing I think about with trading. And this is what I've been trying to really work out with trading is that because what the market is, is, you know, essentially this sort of, you know, microcosm of everything that's going on in the world at any given period. Absolutely. You have to really know about a lot of things. It's not like for poker. Okay. If you want to, you have to understand equity and, you know, implied odds and, uh, you know, folds. There's a very specific niche of things to understand to become very good at poker. And I still think it would be really too hard for me. But, but then when I look at the trading stuff, it's like, you have to understand what's going on with the United States government versus say other government. You have to understand what's happening with this currency. You have to understand what's happening with the tech industry, which I mean, it's just everything affects everything else. And so it's-, it's But what if, what, if I told, what if I told you you only need two things? Okay, then I would be like, great, because two things I can handle. Okay, that's all you need. <laughs> time. <laughs> what are my things? Time and price. How much time? No. Time. One minute? No. Trader? How, well, the idea of the one minute trader is I should be able to look at a market contextually at any time. Yeah. See the price. And with those two pieces of information, buy, sell, or hold. Those are your three options. Yeah. And that's how, and it's easy enough. That that's it. That's, this is what I wonder. So that, is, that is how I behave. Meaning, but you trade all day, so do you? Well, find I, I am not. I am not like. Here's what's funny about trading. Trading is boring. 
if done yeah. well. Playing poker is boring if done well. I don't need another boring game. Yeah. Um, meaning I trade, I, you know, like when I go to Vegas and, you know, I, I have my $300 or $1,000 to lose, I'm not a high roller. It's funny because, but I expect to win right. because I know I can for periods of time. Right. And then I leave. And I, if because I lose, variance will always get you. what's that? Because variance will always get you. Always. You thank you. That is, that is a, such a thing. Variance will always get you, meaning less is more meaning patience pays, meaning women would make better traders if they would open their eyes and see what's in front of them. I mean, I mean and, and men, myself included, are driven by the wrong things typically to get into this business. We wanna get money, we wanna get rich, we're lazy, we're <laughs> all, these are the reasons not to trade. Right. You better like the game, you better like be, knowing when to trade, knowing when not to trade, all these nuances, just like in poker, it's the exact same. See, and it's funny because what you're describing actually, so most people who make their living playing poker play online. So they're playing, say, 10 tables at once instead of sitting down and playing one. And they find live poker extremely boring because they want to be combating the variance. Because they, because they know that they, they also know that there's plenty more shills online than there are at the you know the, the you know world series of poker when you got all the pros and it's no different when it comes to trading and in the sense that my job as a trader i've always acted like a market maker which is a term for kind of the guy like if you've seen the movie trading places right okay yeah eddie murphy dan Aykroyd. it's the best yeah. movie it's from the 80s it's the best movie yeah. to describe what trading actually is okay now the pits are closing worldwide. It's all electronic now, just like poker, right? There's more poker games going on digitally than there are in Vegas and Atlantic City and all the Indian casinos in the wow. world. Yeah. yeah, We both know this. And the, for the same reason, it's about variance. It's about um, we're looking for these spikes high. We're looking for the spikes low. I'm looking for panic. Right. Panic in the streets of London. The Clash is your theme song as a trader. <laughs> meaning how do you, in, meaning how do you behave during those moments of panic and those moments of panic happen every day in some market and our job as a trader is to dig in and find out where there may be an opportunity for us to be a better risk manager than the the dumbo on the other side of the table who is just coming in because he's heard about crypto <laughs> Right. I've heard about, I've heard a word about those crypto. <laughs> I mean, but it, but yeah. that's why it's also so great because I love. I mean, honestly, crypto is the best trading vehicle in my book right now because it moves. That's even my husband saying the same thing. I mean, yeah, I'm doing all these other trades and crypto is the biggest winner so far. Well, meaning yeah, and it, it, but it, but it moves wildly, and that's all you need yeah. is all we need is variance. Coming back to the variance, and thank you for bringing up that word because it's a fantastic word. So, in my world today. And the reason I do these podcasts is because I need to sit on my hands. I need to be more patient and these force me to. And I know, you know, during certain times, especially uh, again, West Coast lunchtime for the market is nine to 11. That's, you know, 12 to two in the East Coast. This is how markets look open, close, everything in between. In other words, we could, we could pack into this. We could pack our work into trading into two hours and the markets are open. You know, the stock market is open six and a half. The futures markets are pretty much 24-7. Yeah. Crypto is truly 24-7. It's the only market. And I like that. I mean, shit, I was selling crypto on Saturday morning at 6,100. I'm like, thank you very little. Thanks. <laughs> Dumbo, Dumbos were coming in because, again, uh, I heard it's, about this. It's, it, I'm reading about it in the paper. I better. I, I just saw it go from 60. I, I heard about it at 60. I didn't buy it. Now it's 6,000. So what happens to the brain is the brain goes 10, 100 full. I got to get in because it's going to 60, you know, and then they read something where it says it's going to 60,000. Oh, God. <laughs> we were just talking about this. And actually, it's interesting. This really parallels something I did an interview this morning. Um, and this poker player was explaining to me that he approaches poker very differently than most players. So for a lot of players, they will just grind, we will grindy, grindy, yeah, we yeah. call it. Basically, they'll wake up at 
noon and they will grind until two o'clock in the morning all day. They're just doing it. And he said, I like to, I like to wake up at four or five in the morning yeah. when all these players are a tired, but B perfect. What you're talking about the panic. Yeah. They've lost. They're down. They're desperate. They're making bad decisions to try to get back to where yeah. they were or whatever. He's like, I like to come in fresh and I only like to work a couple of hours. I come in at the very He's a mar- He's a market maker. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I'm no, like, he is. All this because panic you're talking about, I'm like, oh, like, someone has to be the calm guy in the, in the store. I'll buy. I'll buy. You're selling yeah. at the bottom. I'll buy. Come on. <laughs> bring, bring it to Papa. I'm here. <laughs> or you're buying on Saturday because it's 6100 and you missed the last 6,000 run. I'll sell to you. Sold. Sold. How does it? I mean, I guess. And obviously, this is your podcast, so I shouldn't be. But no. if you were just going to say to, for example females who I think we can both agree are generally speaking the more frugal, more kind of frugal. Well, I I think those are poor choices. I think value is important to women. They will buy security. I think security. Absolutely. Security is number one for women, right? I mean, if, if I I can tell you personally, when I've gone through uh, rough patches financially in in my life with a wife and four kids, she stresses. Yeah. I don't stress. Like you have that entrepreneurial spirit. I do. Like I'm like, eh, you know, come and goes. It comes and goes. She, my wife, is a Montessori teacher. I mean, we're totally at opposite ends. She's patient, kind, sweet. I mean, she's got these three through six year olds, and I'm staring at a screen, calling it an MF all day, and and, yeah, and, and you know, go for the gold. Go get the gold. The world's exploding. But yeah, like I mean, I think we're we're just generally different, and this is obviously an industry that's been primarily dominated by men, especially when it's I try still to it, it's still it's still it still yeah. is dominated by men. However, the the best traders that I've met in my life, and I've been doing this for twenty eight years, are people you've never heard of. You know, just like most have never heard of Andy Duke, and the other. I mean, that is a male. Why is it male dominated? Because it's intimidating to most women. Even though it's not, even though most women are smarter than those 95% of the players. <laughs> they, I mean, I'm just saying most women are smarter yeah. than 95 Like, So they should take it upon themselves to use their intuit and learn more about trading. Learn more about investing. Fit it into whatever your family situation is. There's time. There's plenty. Of, and that's the whole point in the One Minute Trader is... You don't, you don't need, you don't need, you don't need, you don't need that. That's like, that's not something that is important. It's just, it's absolutely irrelevant. So, but what is, whoops, what happened to you? There you go. Um, What, what is important is that you you spend some time and you have a process and you have a, a way of when to behave, when not to behave, when, when to take risk, when not to take risk. And so and it's interesting because I think for me, for example, the reason that I've not invested in a lot at the moment is because, and this, what you're talking about really speaks to me, I guess, because, um, I find myself being a control freak. Uh-huh. I don't trust anyone and I don't think anyone else will take care of my money the way that I would. I don't even really like having my money in the bank. I just don't trust anyone. Perfect. Do you, have- you would make it, you would, you sound like every trader I know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I guess, but it's funny because in my own, you know, my own sort of being stuck in not really knowing or understanding for me, I really guess I'm thinking always that I, my husband keeps saying you don't have to trade full time to right. trade. Right. But for me, I don't know how, I mean, really, really. Yeah. You could, I don't like to date. I don't like to date. I've never liked to day trade. The only time I've day traded is when we've had markets like 98 through 2002, uh, oh, seven through 10, uh, but for the how last, how much do you think you need though to sort of dip your toes in? Well, so that's I feel a, like sometimes the money that people talk about, I'm like, Ooh, wait, well, money well, d- so here's the, that's always a loaded question. Do you want to make a living from it or do you want to just take some money and make some more money? You know, what are your make calculated risk investments? You would like to, you would like to grow your capital. Yes. A, better than possibly indexing does for you buying the S and P 500. Mm-hmm. With a piece of your money, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Fifty grand. That's a lot for me. Well, fair enough. So, so, <laughs> but I, but you could maybe spare like ten thousand. Okay, you could do it with ten thousand. But I'm being honest. Like, if you want some cushion, 
make it 50 grand. Ten, you can do 10 grand with futures. Uh, futures are, are inherently, they, they're built in with what? Right? No, okay. <laughs> that again, the industry wants you to think that they're actually more beneficial because they're 24 seven, they're liquid. You can place buy, sell orders, stops all the time. You don't need to borrow. Like if I want to sell uh, Facebook short, I have to go to my broker. I have to ask for a borrow. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but so I have to ask, I want to sell short the stock. And what that means is that I actually borrow it. You're long the stock and the brokerage says, mm, we will allow 30% of the Facebook shares that are long to be lent to somebody who wants to short it. Right. So you can control them for a certain period of time. Yeah, but it costs me money. So it is, it, it's, they actually, uh, they actually charge me rent to right. borrow the stock and very often stocks that are illiquid, Facebook isn't, but stocks that, you know, maybe just went parabolic like Bitcoin, I can't get a borrow. Like I legally cannot get a borrow. It's a, it's a law. And to short a stock, you're, you're always, because of the mechanism, and you have to be, it has to be an uptick. In other words, I have to offer higher then the stock is trading, it has to trade to that price, then I'm short, but it's an uptick. So it's actually immediately against me, right? right. Just by- Moving in the wrong direction. Immediately, that, that, that's, the, that's the, it's, so if you understand the skew in the market is always, in stocks is always to the upside, that's why, you know, that's why they say buy and hold. Right. But, but, but it's dangerous because not all stocks are created equal. Um, whereas futures, I can buy and sell. I can hit the bid. I can take the I can take the offer without borrowing. It's, it's and it's as simple as that. So the S and P right now is trading twenty five fifty three. I can buy it and sell it. It's probably three by quarter. They go in quarter increments. So it's fifty three yeah. by fifty three and a quarter. I can hit the bid, so I'm short, or I can buy and I'm long, and I can do it like that. And you're the boss of your own destiny. I'm the boss then of my own destiny. And the upside with futures is liquidity, transparency, open 24 seven with the exception, basically they close Friday and they open Sunday at three. I can trade real things like oil, soybeans, uh, gold. I can control more money with my money. Yeah. Understanding that there is leverage in the product. Okay. Right. So for example, one contract of gold, uh, if it goes up ten dollars, you would have uh, ten dollars. So there, are, it goes in ten cent moves, uh, but you would make a thousand dollars. That would be nice. I would like that. <laughs> right. I would take that. Okay. So, but you can you can also buy it, and it goes down ten dollars. You've lost a thousand. So. Oh yeah. But it, like but that. you can control one contract of gold for most brokerages, just basic retail. Less than two thousand dollars. It's just so. I guess when you think about it, it's like everything is so kind of not real. But it just seems so okay. Crazy. So so here's 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 why I say um, the way I trade is much like me watching um, the World Series of Poker. Yeah. The way I look at the market, I see all the cards. I can't play World Series of Poker that way. If I right. could, if I had x-ray vision and nobody you else did, all the money in. <laughs> if I had x-ray vision and could see the cards that are turned over on everybody, like I can on TV, I would play because I know the odds. I can do the math. I'm, I'm good that way. So if, if I showed you a way to trade in the market that basically shows you all the cards and anybody can look at it, it's totally legal. Wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, I'd also like to do the illegal way. If people have some sort of insider trading thing, I'm available. Well, I do not play. I do not. I do not play that way. I don't know anything. I don't. You know, I don't. I don't play the uh, Michael Douglas. Um, hey, you know, Wall Street. I'm telling you, that's that's so, some people are making a lot of money doing that game. The, the, listen, it happens. That's why the SEC is there. That's why yeah. the different commissions. But the beautiful thing about uh, you know futures is we're, we're talking about the, the S&P 500. It's the 500 largest stocks. It's yeah. liquid. I mean, this is the most liquid thing. If you want to, when they say the S&P was up 15 points or down 15, it, that is an index. That index actually doesn't trade. What drives that price is the futures. 
Futures traders, uh, we are the market makers for the world. We are basically explorers of price. We're discovering price every day. What, where is value? So coming back to your, your point that you made uh, about women, they are seeking security. They are seeking control in the, in the financial sense and many yeah, senses, the, per, sure. the purse strings. Yeah. But my wife is a total value buyer, meaning, hey, let's buy the really nice, you know, Traeger grill, even though it costs more because we're not going to have to replace it again. For sure. For and sure. I'm like, you're right. Finding I mean, the I've been married 24 years and I'm finally like, God, she's always smarter than me. I mean, <laughs> we need to get my husband on the show. You need to tell him this too. Well, you're only been, you've only been married three and only together 10. He'll, he'll figure it out about uh, maybe 10, 15. <laughs> Great. I'll have to use all of my patience. Then. That's right. You will. You know, we're like little, we're just, you know, we're big, we're big adult boys is all we are. Oh, I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. So, Sorry, guys, so, but... <laughs> so, so coming back to value, yeah, you seek value, whether it's, you know, buying something because it's going to last for a long time and it's worthwhile and it's more expensive. You know, I want to buy nice sheets. I want to buy a good bed. I mean, you spend half your life in these places. You want to have yeah. a nice kitchen. You want to have the best tools in the kitchen. You want to have the Vitamix versus the bullet. I mean, duh. I have the Vitamix. I hear you. <laughs> Right, but I've had and I've had mine for ten years, and they give it a seven-year, you know, warranty, and I've had it for eleven or twelve. I mean, dumb, you know. Yeah. I've learned because I buy, you know. Whereas I'm like, oh, I'm just going to buy the price, and and so I, the reason I bring this all back to this, you know, value story is, if I could show you with a graphical representation where the auction is, and any market is nothing but a live auction. And you've been, I know you've been to an auction, whether it's a yeah. not-for-profit or, you know, maybe uh, for cattle or, or car, right? You, or for art. Sure. You've, when is it loudest at the auction? Right before the end. Meaning? Right before you get to the price. The price is probably at its apex. Right. When is it quiet, most quiet? In the beginning. When nobody's interested. Yeah. When do you want to buy? When it's... At the loudest? When it's, no, 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 no. That's when it, you want to sell. That's when everyone's going crazy. That's when you want to sell. Oh, we're selling things now too. Absolutely. I'm also selling things. In the because in, in the in the in the in the liquid markets, you can play both sides. Wow. So when it's loud, you're either you know it could be crashing or going to the high. So both extremes, right? That's right. when you want to. That's when we're interested in playing. And when it's quiet, it's probably time to, you know. Figure Maybe out. you've got a sleeper if you've got like a really well, or or we've come back we've come back into an area where there is a reason or value zone as we call them in trading where kind of I can see where the big players are I can see where the big money is and and so if I could show you where the money is on the chart you're going to know when when to behave so markets you know they 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 go to highs and then they they run out of buyers so they have to get drift back but they usually you know the common move is they will go back and test the high but if it can't make another high we run, we've run out of buyers again and more likely it's going to go lo even lower right and same thing on the downside it's like we go to a low it's probably not the last time we're going to see that we'll test it again and if it goes lower then we got to go to another level so it's all if you think about it it's, it's really markets don't go straight up and they don't go straight down most of the time Except in periods like 08, 9, 2000 through 2002, we had many days where it's scary. And you need to know what you're doing, and that's context. But most of the time, it's inhale, exhale, and, and, and just going through you know, the regular motions. It's so interesting that to imagine that really there is not a certain value on anything, but nothing really, because you can basically bet on all of these things and because none of them are for sure okay. stagnant or certain anywhere. It's so crazy to imagine that everything is just, what do people think it's worth? I don't know, let's see. I'm gonna take the word bet out of your um, okay. vocabulary though, but here's why, here's why. Because in trading, it's not over until I get out of the trade. So what if I told you 80% of my winning trades over 28 years have been against me at some point? And you just hold on to them. 
within the, the context of my risk parameters all, is, the other, is the other caveat. In other words, if I'm willing to risk $2,000 on this trade and it goes against me 500, I don't have to get out even though I'm wrong right now. Right. 2,000 is kind of my... then you're getting out when everyone's screaming. You're like, no, I'm cool. I'm going to wait it I'm out. I'm fine. Or maybe I buy some more. Maybe it's part of my... I'll buy until I get to that area. So that's what I mean by a trade goes against me. If my risk is defined... And, 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 and so it's really this way of looking at it. I accept my loss as soon as I put on the trade. If you can't tell me where you're wrong, you shouldn't trade. So when you bought Bitcoin, you didn't think, you didn't think about that. No, right. I actually was using it because all these sites that I was on were on okay. discounts for using Bitcoin. So, so that I, the you're getting paid. Yeah. So you, you kind of, it was a byproduct of a byproduct. Okay. Yeah. But, but my point is next time you buy, you should ask yourself, what am I wrong? Yeah. Because if you can't define that, then you'll never know when you're wrong. And then you'll, you, your mind can tell you, oh, well, I'm in it for the long haul now. I've, I've been buying gold since 1900 and now it's 1200. So I'm going to keep buying it. Well, what if it's 800? Oh, that's okay. I'll still keep buying it. You know, and, and that's where the trader becomes an investor. And, and they're two different things. Right. So uh, again, I'm coming back to the point where if you could know two things, time and price, and, and be able to become a very, very good risk manager just with those two things and forget about what's going on in Saudi Arabia, what's going on in Thailand, what's going on in Singapore and China, currency rates, until it matters. Like it doesn't, like it does, like honestly, the best traders know this. I don't read, the, the news is already built in the price in the market. The market knows the price. The market, the new, news is old, right? That's why it's news. Right. So it's already, the market already knows that Donald Trump's a, a, a funny buffoon character. And yet we're at all time highs. Right. The mar market is always forward looking. And, um, you know, things aren't that bad as far as the market's concerned today. And there's enough fear until, it, so it, the market is also, and this is similar in, in poker. And, and I don't know if they use the same term, but I call the market, the free markets, the best trap game in the world. Meaning it's gonna trap the most people it can before it actually goes. So right now, like if you, like I, I call, there's so many people that are pretty smart, probably smarter than me, and they're telling me, oh, the $23 trillion deficit that our country is running, we're gonna be bankrupt and gold's gonna be 2,000. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I agree with you. That's all true, but it doesn't help me today to trade. Right. So that macro tourism makes you sound smart at a cocktail party, but it's also why economists don't make good traders. Yeah, and also why I don't know what that information really could ever get you in the long run because I think about it all the time. And well, I'm like, not helpful. Not helpful. Well, and, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, I say irrelevant. Irrelevant, right? It doesn't yeah. matter. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, because I, I used to, I used to, I used to go home and spout that shit to my wife, and she'd be like, "Oh my god," just rolling her eyes, and I'd be like, "Tomorrow we still have to pay rent, right?" Okay, so just, <laughs> right. And and so that is, but. Again, you're pragmatic. You get it right off the bat. So you could be you could be a fine risk manager because you have to you have to look at the now. You have to be present. It's all about right now, and that doesn't mean that there's a trade. Again, buy, hold, sell. Those are the three things pretty much that all trades uh, and the complexity of them are still around those three things. Buy is a trade, sell is a trade, and hold is always a trade. In other words, not trading is a trade. Just Hold like, raise, yeah, exactly. It's the same, exactly. <laughs> Hold, raise, and call. Yes. I'm like, I can definitely see the, the analogies here. And so, and so Fair options well. are a derivative of an underlying asset. So I'm assuming your husband is trading equity options. So he's trading options on stocks, all right? There are yeah. options on futures. So leverage upon leverage. Oh it's, gosh, it's just... So it's just a, you know, different levels of, you know, Calc 1 or Calc 2. It's not that complicated, though. But, and also because I think for him, too, in the beginning, he was not trading premiums. And then he had this big realization a few days ago. It's like, oh, my gosh, if I 
a few days ago, a few weeks ago, it's like, oh, premium, this is actually so, which kind of reminds me a little of the futures. It's like people are afraid of something, but then yeah. maybe there's not really the well, right. Well, futures thing. are liquid. I mean, they're extremely liquid. That's my point is you can go in, you know, I mean, I'm not a big trader and I can trade a thousand lot and which is a big trade that, but that's not big in the market. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, a thousand lot would be how many, you know, it's it, how many billions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's huge. If I was trading, you know, a thousand, you know, contracts of gold, because it's basically one, I'm controlling 1000 ounces of gold at $1,250 or wherever it's trading right now. Right. And I can do it with, like I told you, maybe, you know, thirty thousand dollars in margin. So crazy. Yeah. Uh, now again, that's not so abstract though. It's, it's not what I recommend abstract. people do, but you know, but but if you understand, but you just need to. It's, it's as simple as how much money can you lose, and then if you don't know where you're wrong, you shouldn't be trading. In other words, until you until you can figure out, oh, I'm good with that. I'm good with that risk. You know, I'm good with losing two thousand dollars or whatever the number is and then you know and you do it with one thing and you do it well until you can until you know that product and then you add the second product and build from there and that's again where i think women are much more pragmatic much more efficient with their brains and prag that prag pragmatism is so powerful and men just are stupid ego monsters especially you know it's such a youth game the trading game is you've got young you know, 20 to 35 year olds controlling, you know, millions and trillions of dollars every day. It's so interesting though, because even one of the things they teach you in the very beginning in poker is like, okay, once you put the chips out, whether you're bluffing, whether you think you have you the better, best hand, whether whatever, once you put the chips out, you better accept that they might not be coming back to you. And because otherwise, then you're looking at your stack thinking, oh, I used to have this much, now I only have this much. And the more you do that, the more your uh, well, this psychological elements make you try to get back to what you had before instead of just being like, this is what I've got now. And you see that, right, all the time at the table. I mean, the guy, like, and you see it in trading, you're, you're either, over aggressive, betting too big on the poker table, yeah, or betting too big in the markets, right. uh, fear, afraid to trade, or yeah. afraid to bet. Ooh, fold, yeah. fold, yeah. fold. That's me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I know that about myself, right? So I, I will get destroyed playing poker against you know anybody with basic skills. I'll get destroyed. So. <laughs> I'll get destroyed in the market. So we no, well, like, but again, I, th I I do believe, and and part of the reason why I started teaching again ten years ago, eleven years ago, as I guess now is, I do believe it is a skill that can be learned, and I think it can be applied to the individual personality, and it must fit again personality and style and life, what is going on in your world, and if it doesn't, then find the way that it does. Otherwise, you know, keep searching for the way that does. So. Well, I think for a lot of, you know, poker players, for example, one of the reasons they choose this profession is basically because it gives them the freedom to also, you know, wake up when they want or, you know, travel the way that they want. And it's interesting because I can see how truthfully, if you could learn to trade, it also gives you quite a bit of freedom in your lifestyle. Yeah. You know, depending on what, if you wanted to maintain another job or you wanted to live in another country or really it's whatever you wanted to do, it's up to you to, you're the boss of your own destiny then. You said it perfectly. You are the boss of your own, uh, of your destiny. And in trading, that means do weird things happen to your point? Again, I got to stress about all these things. Yeah, they do. And you just have to know that you're wrong at that point, right? You can get out. You can always get back in. The liquidity is key, but accepting that makes the game so much easier. If I said to you, if, you know, if I said, Hey, listen, Sarah, I want to spend some time with you. I'm going to teach you some basics over the time uh, and build your confidence. I mean, would you be willing to do it? I, I'm throwing it out here on the air for everybody. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll, I'll take you under my wing and, and show you a few tricks of the trade and we'll build from there. And, and I assure you, your confidence in being a risk manager will be such that you're okay letting those chips go and putting them on the table. And you said it, like you're fine doing that on the poker table. So right. why wouldn't you be able to do that in, in the, you know, in the liquid market world? Why wouldn't it translate when you have x-ray goggles? <laughs> well, but it, here's the other thing. These aren't, this is nothing proprietary that I've come up with. This was made by floor yeah. traders on the Chicago board of options exchange in the late seventies, early eighties. And it's called yeah. market profile. 
it's a tool anybody can use. It's the only tool that I've found in my 28 years, and I've tried all of them. It's the only tool that tells me where the market is right now and where the risk is per my uh, you know, way of viewing the markets. That's it. That's all it tells me. It does not predict. It does not. It is not the holy grail. It's still a hard way to make money, just as playing poker is. It absolutely is a hard way to make money. Just but like anything is. It's just like anything is. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I love the idea like, oh, we're going to get rich and we can be lazy. Yeah. Nope, doesn't work doesn't like work that. doesn't work that way. And if it does, again, take your money off the table when you buy Run. the Bitcoin. <laughs> hey, I won the lottery. Thank you. If you bought 20 Bitcoins a few years ago. That's right. Okay, just see you later. Cash it out. Cash it out <laughs> and uh, put, you know, go buy yourself a, a, a nice house. Yep. Can't take, you know. <laughs> It's yours. A cheap wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a frugal, smart <laughs> wife by your side will go a long way in managing that aspect of things. Yeah. Man. Poor kids. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, She's I'm... a saint already to me. She's a saint. She is a saint. <laughs> you like that? You like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I tell her that all the time. Well, sir, I, I appreciate you coming on today, and uh, I hope uh, I, I will take you up, and I will offer uh, some assistance if you'd like to take it. And hey, yeah, I will not say no. I'm not a dummy. Poker news, continued success. I'm going to be uh, become a, a bigger listener. Uh, I did, as I said, listen for the first time, and I bet you I can pick up some things about risk management from listening to the smart people that you have on your podcast. So thanks for coming on. Well, I would love to have you on the podcast, by the way, and thank, thank you, you so much for having me. It was really great. I can't wait to brag to my husband all about <laughs> I'm just on trading podcast now, so no big deal. <laughs> well, thanks again for doing it, and uh, I, I will uh, – maybe maybe we should start doing like a weekly segment. Like what did you, know, what did, what did you learn this week, Sarah? Yes. Like a, they do things like this in poker where it's like you take a movie and a coach shows them, and then it's like, whoa, people are – you know, it's right. like – Oh, everyone has and you take your ten thousand dollars and say, you know, this week I made two hundred, and they'll go, wow, okay. I'm on board. All right, yeah, All right. hit me up. Okay, we're gonna do it. <laughs> take care, bye, man. Thanks. <laughs>